My name is Aiki. I look after Google Play business development for Middle East and Africa. And with me today is uh, Hugo, who's going to come up on stage in a couple of minutes to talk about Malio Games, a very successful game developer out of Lagos, Nigeria, who develops specifically titles for emerging markets out of an emerging market. So today, you're going to hear a lot of designated content that speaks to, to growth in user acquisition and device penetration. But with this talk, we would like to invite you to think about the next billion users and where they're going to come from, particularly with regards to user growth. So we've seen astounding development in the last couple of years. I'm sure we all have highly capable devices in our pockets. We have high-speed data connections that are always on. And the data you pay for today is pretty much a lot cheaper than it was just two, three, or four years ago. But every now and again, it's important to really take a moment and reflect what has happened over the last couple of years that got us to this point and see how we can take those learnings to really continue and accelerate that growth over the next coming years. Again, particularly with regards to user growth. So again, today we will be talking about building high quality games and apps that work effectively, not only for the user of today, but for the users of the next coming years. Um, so we've seen tremendous growth from emerging markets. And we project that about 80% of smartphone growth globally is going to come from emerging markets by 20, um, 2019. And as more users get access to these devices, they get connected for the first time, and the first time making any experiences with the web, they will be looking for new ways to experience the internet, to shop, to entertain themselves, to communicate. And that is itself is bringing up a massive opportunity for all of us in this room. So again, 80% of smartphone growth up until 2019 will be coming from emerging markets. So the, what's important here is to then look at the challenges these users face and to start designing experiences that will cater to these challenges. I'm backing this up with numbers from Google Play that Mark referenced in his early keynote today. We see a tremendous increase in or an accelerated growth in downloads as well as in consumer spend from emerging markets. And we don't see any indication that this is going to stop anytime soon. So if you compare emerging markets with developed markets, we see significantly faster growth, just about four times as fast, while consumer spend is double, and we expect this to further grow. It's an exciting trend, and it's important to realize that this is happening, yet put this in context and see where this growth is actually coming from. So first, we all know fast networks are awesome. We all have instant information and instant capabilities in our pockets today. But if you look at the reality of today, still just about half of mobile internet usage is coming from a 2G connection. And I'm sending out an open question into this room. When was the last time you were on a 2G connection? When was the last time you actually opened your own game or app from a 2G connection? If you extrapolate this out and project what's going to happen until 2020, we'll still expect one in three users to be, or just about one in three users to be on 2G. And that, that resembles about one billion users. So definitely a massive opportunity, but again, with different challenges that need to be addressed accordingly. For example, if you look at the variation of network speed and the availability of networks just across the board, you can see, for example, here, India on the, on the uh, center right, average speed of Indian, um, of Indian usage Indian internet usage, pardon me, is about a tenth of that in the UK. While the quality and the adoption of high-speed networks is very low, just about one in five or 20% of broadband connections are above four megabytes per second. So again, data availability being very scarce, and the speeds, once you get there, are very low. So these users behave significantly different from the users today. Finally, another one of key challenges in emerging markets is the data cost. Data is expensive in a lot of these markets, and they're just about to go down in prices. Just look um, at, at comparative data here that actually looks at the comparative data cost as relative to the um, gross income of a, of a median household. And you can see that uh, um, a data plan in Nigeria is about 10 times as much relative to the UK. So again, these users are super sensible to how data is being consumed from your app, and being good stewards of their data plan is just um, appreciated and good business. So with that in mind, we want to help and drive the 
uh, engagement in those regions and to support the growth in these markets. We have created a framework which we call the next billion and it's centered around six key topics which I will outline in very briefly now and reference some resources where you can um, um, read up in a lot more detail about these, uh, these elements. So without further ado, if you're looking at the six pillars that we invite you to take a look at, it's connectivity, device, compatibility, data cost, battery consumption, content, and commerce. And again, I'm going to cover everything very briefly. We're going to be here all afternoon if you want to speak in any of, about any of those in more detail. So connectivity. Ah, by the way, I just wanted to outline, this is by no means just the best practice for emerging markets. These are good practices and good principles to implement even for the users today. So connectivity, you want to assure smooth loading, of your, smooth loading of your content. You should prioritize your bandwidth requests and make sure that the top requests are served first, that the most useful and relevant information is loaded at the beginning. For example, loading text before you're loading images. Don't duplicate your network um, requests and save files locally where applicable. You could use the connectivity manager, which is actually a dynamic API that gives you feedback on what kind of, of uh, connectivity you should expect from, uh, from this device, and then change your app serving accordingly. Images are typically the biggest perpetrators of, of um, slow load time, slow connectivity. So uh, um, I invite you to think about the standards of, uh, of um, the images you load, which formats, which uh, resolution you actually load, and where it becomes relevant, and make sure that you're using the appropriate sizes of those images. Lastly, with regards to connectivity, I encourage you all to look at how your app and game performs in an offline environment. Just go ahead, turn your phone into airplane mode, open up your app, and see what happens. See where it actually finds bugs, see where it actually gets stuck, and what experiences you need to improve to assure a good offline experience. Moving on to device compatibility. It's a huge range of devices with big screens, small screens, expandable storage, small storage, high density screens, and so forth. Um, so it's, I guess, all of us face the issue of developing an app and a game that can really run on all of these devices. So you should look at what, uh, what capacity your app is actually invoking and then optimize for that. Keep in mind that a lot of these devices that we're talking about are still one megabyte in RAM and below. Um, so um, you should think about how your app actually runs in these kind of environments. And games should be optimized to render smoothly in those kinds of, um, of uh, environments. Um, look at screen sizes. As I mentioned, these, uh, these devices that are coming online are likely to be low cost. Um, they're likely to be longer in their, in their life cycles and you want to make sure that you have your, your exposure tested on different screen sizes, screen resolution, and pixel densities. Um, Eddie mentioned before that uh, the new emulator in Android Studio is vastly improved. It's increased in speed, and it allows you to test very quickly for these elements, so changing the device resolution and the device size. Just as an example, why would you load a high-resolution image on a low-resolution device? That's just, you know, a, a lot of waste in a many different factors. Moving on to efficient memory usage. Um, users see that screen at all time. They can get a push notification when their memory is running out, and they can actually see a sorted list of how much memory and how much storage your apps are actually using. Um, so here's the pro tip for this one. You can use the API call of is low RAM and actually get feedback in real time to figure out if this is a highly capable device or a low capable device, and then change your processes accordingly. Also, background processing. Background processing is typically what drives up a lot of the storage in the, um, in the, on the user's device, and that's perfectly fine. Many apps may invoke processes in the background, but you should be good stewards of your user's um, device memory, and so you want to start up your background processes finish them, try to bundle them into one round, and then shut down the process in order not to drain um, the user's memory as well as the battery. Moving on to smart storage, think about installing the, or just running this one line of code that allows users to push their apps onto their SD card. Um, this can go a long way for, for devices with expandable storage. 
Um, as I mentioned before, users can actually sort how much um, data is consumed and how much space is consumed uh, on your phone and can see the list of the most draining apps on top, which will then uh, drive a lot of the uninstalls, uninstall rates up. So you want to keep your device consumption low and make sure that you are um, frequently clearing the cache that you're creating. Um, this one is a, a tip that I'm sure you're not going to hear often today. So this is the one and only time I guess you will hear this today, but think about backwards compatibility. Think about um, these new users coming online with slightly older devices and not necessarily always on the latest version of Android. So um, I'd invite you to run your apps with the minimum SDK 14, but the target SDK 23 in order to really cater to a wide variety of users that are being kept with the latest features. Also, think about integrating the Google Play Services API because we will ensure that the users get updates on time and, make, and we will make sure that the users are catered to with the features that actually work for their devices. Moving on, and I'm already finishing off. So Hugo, get ready. Well, it's your, it's your time to speak in a minute. I'm looking at data cost. As we said before, data is expensive in these countries, and it's only very slowly becoming cheaper. We're used to having cheap always on data, but the reality is about half of users don't have that privilege today. Installing your app is an actual cost to the user, and think about how, real, how sizable your APK actually is, how much space and how much data usage the user's actually going to consume by just downloading your app. If you have a prepaid package for 200 megabytes a month, how likely are you to actually download a game that is 100 megabytes on, on, a, on free data? So again, think about your APK size. Um, there's a great talk from Google I.O., which I encourage you to take a look at. It's called Put Your APK on a Diet. Um, definitely worth checking out. The sweet spot for emerging markets is around 10 megabytes. That's what you should be aiming for. We see a high drop off with every megabyte that you add in weight. Now, I realize for a lot of the game developers in this room, this, is, you know, this number is completely unreasonable. Building a high-quality 3D game in 10 megabytes is, is very tricky. And oftentimes, the third-party libraries you're using on their own are already exceeding those 10 megabytes. So if you can't make this number work, and this number sounds completely unreasonable to you, consider multi-APK. Launching multiple APKs into different device categories just to make sure that you can cater to those users as well. So again, users are sensitive, sensitive to APK sizes. Images, as we noted before, are the biggest offenders with this. You want to reduce cost, and you want to consider multi-APK um, to serve this. Again, um, Android Studio and Firebase Analytics allows you to test and see how much data your app is actually consuming. You can benchmark the data, and um, being, again, good stewards of this data will go a long way with the users. Moving to battery consumption. You want to eliminate unnecessary wake-ups. You want to batch your network requests whenever they come in. And you want to use the Network Manager API, again, which can give you feedback on what kind of network is expected. Um, moving on to content. Users everywhere want tailored content. We know this from our own data. When we're looking at Google Play and we optimize it for different scenarios, um, highlighting and surfacing specific tailored content for a local audience, we see significant improvements in adoption, ad adoption and engagement. So localization is important. Think about fast, responsive UIs. Think about the UI best practices, which we talked about today in material design. Um, these, are all, these are all best practices to really cater to a user in a, in a local environment to make sure that they feel at home and that they feel that this environment is tailored for their use. Last but not least, commerce, we all strive to make this a business and not just a fun exercise. So catering to those markets, you want to adjust, you adjust your monetization strategy accordingly. There's multiple different ways of driving revenue from these markets. Obviously, users are more sensitive to price, but you want to use um, you want to use multiple different monetization schemes to really figure out what works best, some of which might be best catered to with in-app purchases, while other markets are specifically more susceptible to ad revenue. So when driving, um, when driving different um, ways, we want to make Google Play a commerce platform for you and enable, um, enable 
good businesses in those regions as well. So think about the barrier of entry. Where do you want to charge? At what levels and, and what price points do you want to charge for your content? Um, and offer prices in local currency. Um, we've just referred to earlier about um, pricing templates. I encourage you to use those and to make sure that your prices are adjusted in the local currency at the right numbers. And in addition to that, you should also take a look at the Big Mac index, the purchasing power of a single dollar in a single country. If you multiply that with the prices you're actually charging, you automatically become more sensible to that local market because you're charging something that is actually equivalent to what, uh, to what users can afford. So I'm summarizing the points we've made earlier. And again, there's a lot of resources which I'll share um, after Hugo's talk um, on how to really look at these best practices, figure out which ones are relevant for you, and then go out and implement them. But if there's three main pieces of information that I would like to, to share today and to encourage you to take home with you after this talk, is that one billion users will still be on 2G by 2020. The average mobile data speed in Vietnam, India, Argentina, Brazil is below four megabytes per second. And the relative cost of data in emerging market is about 10 times higher compared to that in the UK. So think about fast apps that are reliable and lightweight in order to best cater for the next billion users and leverage that growth going forward. With that, um, I would like to, oh, sorry, that was the wrong button. I would like to invite Hugo Obi from Malio Games to speak about his experience developing okay. for emerging markets. <laughs> Hi, so it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, as Aiki said, my name is Hugo Obi. I'm from Malia Games um, in Lagos, Nigeria. We build locally relevant games, um, primarily for the Nigerian market. Our vision is to share the African narrative with the world through games. Um, just show of hands, um, who has been to the African continent before? Excellent. Um, and secondly, who's been to Nigeria before? Fantastic, a few people in the room. Um, so you would understand how unique this part of the world is in terms of connectivity. Um, so I'll just you know, run through a little bit of a background about Africa, talk a little bit about Nigeria, and then like, we're gonna go dive in a little bit into a specific user segmentation that I think would hopefully enable you to understand a little bit better about the kinds of people um, that you'll be targeting if you decide to come into a market like Nigeria. So most of my time was spent talking about Nigeria. But firstly, in terms of like Africa as a continent, um, you know, some people still think it's a single country, but obviously uh, we have about 54 countries um, in the continent. There's quite a lot of languages there, um, but the population is very large. Um, but the connectivity in terms of people who are actually connected to the internet, um, as you can see from here, it's about 28.1% um, of people who connected. This is a mobile first market, which means that a lot of people who connect to the internet actually experience that connection via their mobile devices. So tablets, computers are not as prevalent as mobile devices are. Um, so in terms of Nigeria, Nigeria is a very, very, very large market. Um, we're just under 200 million people in terms of population. Um, and you know, we're the second largest economy in the continent. Um, but what is really, really interesting is that we have a lot of mobile connectivity, uh, at least like compared to everybody else. So we're just under 100 million people who connect to the internet, mostly via their mobile devices. Um, in terms of people who actually have access to mobile, mobile phones or the number of like, uh, mobile lines that we have in the, continent, in the country is about 200 million. So a lot of people have dual devices, dual SIM cards, um, and people are connecting using multiple devices. Um, but what, um, what I'm really excited about sharing today is the user segmentation, uh, which I touched on earlier. Um, we've been able to identify four unique um, custom segments um, in Nigeria. And this customer segment is actually divide, um, defined by their connectivity, so how they actually connect to the internet uh, more than anything else. But looking at Nigeria as a broad market, um, what is really... Um, Interesting from a social angle is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Nollywood, um, is the third largest movie, movie industry in the world um, behind, um, um, behind um, sorry, Hollywood and Bollywood, of course, um, from India. 
um, it's actually the second largest uh, contributor to our GDP um, after oil and gas. Um, so a huge employer of people, and, and the locals are really, really um, keen on their local movies. Um, our music is actually a very huge export. Um, so there's a lot of hip hop music coming up from Nigeria, which is um, going across different parts of um, the continent in Africa, and obviously a huge export here in the West as well. So when you go to clubs and bars in most popular cities, um, you are more likely to come across um, one of our musics. Um, football is huge. It's, uh, it's second to religion um, in Nigeria. Um, we are fanatics uh, when it comes to football. Um, we love our Premiership, we love our La Liga, um, and you know, there was this story about these two Nigerians who got into a massive fight over um, which footballer was the best footballer in the world, Lino Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, so we don't take it very lightly. Um, religion, like I said, is, you know, that's like pretty much every street in Nigeria has a church. Um, so um, I, I, I watched a, a, a little clip recently um, that showed that the top 10 richest pastors, um, depending on what denomination you are, but the top 10 richest pastors in the world, five of them are Nigerians, um, four of whom are actually in Nigeria. So despite the fact that we do have huge economic challenges, um, people are very generous when it comes to church. Um, and then fashion is sort of like becoming a modern trend, um, and this is huge adoption for, you know, like fashion design. People are very, um, you know, interested in what they wear uh, and are shopping for these kind of things. Um, politically, the way the opportunities, I mean, this is kind of like opportunities and challenges at the same time, but like politically, what the government is really interested in is on e in education. So education is a huge challenge for the continent, so any sort of like apps, that enable people to learn on the go uh, on their mobile devices is actually a very huge hit. And then anything around empowerment is also a very huge hit because the government has a very large um, youth population and you know, getting these people educated and giving them access to like, employment opportunities is actually a huge challenge for them. On the mobile side, um, you know, Nigeria has huge infrastructure problems. So I actually came um, to London via Cape Town um, and in Cape Town, they have, I mean, like in South Africa, they occasionally have something called load shedding, um, which is where people, you know, for a couple of hours in a day, um, the, the government is kind of like distributing power um, between di different districts, so people are, um, it's possible for you to actually lose power for a couple of hours in a day. In Nigeria, it's a completely different thing. I mean, like, there's nothing, there's no such thing as load shedding, it's just power outage. And this is probably, what, about 80, 90% of the time, for those of you who've been to Nigeria, it's a huge, huge, huge problem. Which means that battery, um, battery life is actually hugely important to mobile users. Um, most people have battery uh, power packs that they, that they use with their mobile phones, but that is not sufficient. Um, internet, um, like Ike said earlier, is extremely expensive, and that is something that people are very conscious about. There's not a lot of transparency between the internet service providers and the actual end consumers in terms of what their data is being used for. So you're more, um, you know, you can buy a data bundle of maybe two, two gigs and it can run out in a couple of hours. And people don't have a huge understanding as to how the data is actually being utilized um, for the amount of money they're paying. Um, free peer-to-peer -peer communication tools are, are massive um, because of, you know, voice, um, voice and data costs. So people adopt these products um, to enable them to keep in touch with friends and family. Um, and then internet connectivity speed is also under huge challenge. And this is you know, around the infrastructure difficulties for a lot of the telcos and internet service providers in the country. Um, but so let's, I'm gonna dive into the different user segments. So um, earlier I touched on um, the four user segments. So if you're bringing a product into Nigeria, you're looking at the Nigerian market, these are four unique categories of users based on their connectivity. So we have what, what, I, what we termed as the always on um, segment. Now these guys are pretty much the types of people that you would expect to meet in any developed market. They're well educated, most of them actually have some level of foreign education, they're well traveled. Um, they have, um, they earn decent salary by Nigerian standards. Um, they connect to the internet via multiple devices. What they really care about is connection speed more than price. Price is not really, they're not as price sensitive. Um, they access their content via the app stores. Um, they have multiple payment options, so they can, they, they're very comfortable paying with credit cards and debit cards or using um, payment platforms like PayPal because they've lived abroad and they've been, they, they understand the security um, 
benefits or the convenience benefits of actually um, doing transactions online. Um, you know, you would find them using apps like Uber, Snap, um, YouTube, they're huge video consumers, um, and they play games that require you to be connected when you're playing, so they're not too bothered about that. So that's the very first group, and represent about 5% of the market. Um, the second group is what we tag as the mostly on group. Um, so data cost is obviously very expensive. Um, and these are sort of like the kinds of people who, um, you know, swap between being online and offline. Um, and, and this is kind of like trying to, trying to manage um, the data that they, they, they have access to or, or they can afford. Um, they usually connect using either a phone or a tablet. Um, PCs are not, you know, um, we don't have a lot of like fixed um, landlines or um, cable connections, so most people are connecting using some kind of like a MiFi device or some kind of router um, on obviously the 3G connect connections. Um, again, these guys are so sort of like reasonably educated. Um, they are employed, semi-employed individuals. Um, they typically purchase data bundles, um, so there is kind of like some kind of cap around what they buy, so they'll do like a, a four gig plan or five gig plan or 10 gig plan um, value for 30 days. So obviously they're very conscious of what they're using their data to consume. Um, so they typically use apps that enable them some kind of like offline uh, access as well as like online access. Um, they're huge users of like communication tools um, and play, you know, they have access to games as well. They access their games directly from the app stores as well. They're, because of their level of education, they understand how to use stores like Google Play. Um, the next group is our on-demand group. So this group is kind of like where you start to see a lot more um, people who um, are, spend more time offline than they do online. Um, they usually um, access the internet using product bundles. So what product bundles do is that there is a basket of applications that you can get unlimited access to over a 30-day period. Um, so that would be like your communication tools, your, instant mess um, your social tools, your instant messaging tools, your emailing tools. And this is what they would typically pay for. So their access to the internet is actually limited um, in that they might not necessarily be able to use a browser or access YouTube in the same way that they can actually use um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, folks like this typically have one device, so they usually access um, connections via their, their, their phone. Um, this is now where you start to see a lot more people who are using like very low-end phones or, you know, fairly second-hand phones actually are also very popular for this group. Um, in terms of payments, um, they, they're not very comfortable using cards or using any form of like any payment platforms. So they would do direct career billing for payment. Um, you know, they're more comfortable paying with cash. Um, and in terms of how they access content for their, for their mobile devices, they would typically do use file sharing, um, file sharing applications to access pretty much um, access applications offline. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Zender, but Zender is a very popular application um, for, this, uh, for this group. Um, and then the last group that we're going to look at is you know, where majority of the population actually falls into um, from our analysis, somewhere around about 75% of the population falls into this group. Um, so this is like your self-employed, your artisans, uh, they're mostly uneducated. Um, again, like they would access the internet via product bundles um, or you know limited price plans, but most of the time they're actually offline. Um, they're now using like you know really really low end feature phones. So there's a lot of um, a lot of Chinese manufacturers are entering into the market with like you know, really basic um, basic devices for this sort of like segment. Um, in terms of like how they access their apps, they, when they go to the markets to purchase their phones, there are um, there are um, people in the markets that actually install the apps, so they pay to actually have apps installed. Um, so this group is more likely not to be familiar with app stores and you know, the sort of like freedom that they can actually have with accessing the app stores on their own. Um, in terms of their top apps, you're more likely to see them using um, browsers like Opera, which allows them to actually get faster speed um, to, to sort of like, you know, get access to the internet uh, without necessarily utilizing like a huge um, level of bandwidth. So when I, so the last thing that I want to touch on is sort of like this kind of like matrix of like how all of these things are sort of like connected to like the um, design principles for um, the next billion um, users. 
So in terms of like connectivity, um, you know, there's a lot of awareness around the fact that most of the people who are gonna be um, accessing the internet will be using like 2G, 3G connections. A lot of people are gonna be using low-end smartphones um, and feature phones in some, in some instances. Um, for internet connection or, or it's like connectivity, it's gonna be mostly around like PSG Go, some kind of like PSG Go limited um, product bundle package which they'll be using. Um, so yeah, I mean like that's, that's kind of like my, my thoughts on the subject. Thank you very much.